Though defeated, Mr. Churchill is acclaimed as a great war leader. Out of the election melting pot comes his successor. Confidently, he faces his responsibility to Britain and the world. Only one previous Prime Minister in modern times had a mandate anything like as big as Thatcher's after the 1983 election. And that was Clement Attlee. He and his colleagues had used the mandate they'd been given after the war to transform the fundamental structure of Britain along socialist lines, creating the NHS and the welfare state, and bringing both the nation's utilities and industries into state ownership. They rebuilt Britain so thoroughly and solidly that its basic assumptions became all but immutable. Even after Attlee's government gave way to 13 solid years of the Tories, and on through the Wilson and Heath eras, the basic premise of the welfare state, socialised medicine, the mixed economy and nationalisation as at the very least a perfectly valid option, were treated as gospel, as fundamental as the air, just the way the world worked. This became known as the post-war consensus, although the term implies a more conscious and collaborative process than it really was. In 1945, when Mr Attlee came to power, his government and their manifesto were modernisers. By the late 70s, it was creaking. 30 years had gone by, times had changed, but the system doggedly remained calibrated for the 40s. The future had caught up with the post-war consensus. Whether you agreed with its basic assumptions or not, there was no getting away from the fact that it was in dire need of some kind of reform or wholesale replacement. And wouldn't you know it, there's a whole new idea just waiting to take over. Attlee had had his mandate and transformed Britain with it. Now it was Thatcher's turn. Wave started small. The first public utility, as opposed to private company, to be denationalised under Thatcher's watch wasn't British Telecom or some major power utility, but the British Transport Docks Board, a minor governmental body that oversaw two dozen or so docks formerly run by railway companies in the days before British Rail. The Transport Act 1981 transformed the BTDB into Associated British Ports, which was immediately floated on the stock exchange. The company still exists to this day, accounting for a quarter of Britain's sea trade, and is now owned by Goldman Sachs. That all went painlessly enough, and functioned as a decent proof of concept. Now, Thatcher had won a second term, with the kind of majority that practically functioned as an enabling act. So nothing was safe. British Telecom was next on the menu. The communications sector had been growing, developing and mutating for decades, and arguably still is today by its very nature. The GPO had been split off into separate mail and telecommunications departments in 1969, and the Thatcher government had finally prized them apart altogether in 1981 to create British Telecom. And even that was an overture to the full capitalist symphony. The docks board had been the smallest of fry. Selling it off was both an exercise in general principle and a way of, with no pun intended, testing the water. It proved denationalisation could work, but made little or no impact on the British public. Only Financial Times readers and hardcore boat nerds even noticed it was happening. British Telecom was inevitably different. This was one of the country's biggest and most important companies. If the sell-off was a success, if they could get Britain on side with what they were doing, then the sky was the limit as far as what else could be sold. They weren't just selling British Telecom here, they were selling the entire policy. Trouble was, the term denationalisation sounded negative, like something was being taken away, which it was. The PR conscious 80s, they needed a more peppy, forward-looking term. Apparently it was coined by the Energy Secretary David Howell, latterly father-in-law to George Osborne. It was logical enough, as the opposite of nationalisation, privatisation. All the stops were pulled out to sell the notion to the public. Adverts were prepared that both carefully acknowledged the general public's questions and reservations about the process, 
and soothingly dismissed them in the voice of Joss Ackland, accompanied by some explicitly sinister quasi-Maoist propaganda imagery. In November, a prospectus will be issued for the sale of shares in British Telecom. I would want to know um, if I could defer the payments or whether all the cash was to be paid at the, uh, at, at the start. How much do the shares cost? Presumably, uh, we will see an awful lot more of the uh, relevant information produced. Reserve your prospectus now. It will tell you how much the shares cost and how you buy them, along with a lot more information you'll need in order to come to a decision. Ring 0272 272 272 and find out about sharing British Telecom's future. This was a cultural revolution, but a good one, that will make you rich as long as you quite literally bought into it. Meanwhile, the recently retired telephone mascot Busby was pressed into strictly unofficial service for the other side, at least until British Telecom started getting the tidges. Of course, everyone hated Busby, so he didn't help their cause either way. The gamble paid off. Sure, the idea of privatisation was initially unpopular, subject to various think pieces in The Guardian and even the Financial Times from frustrated Keynesians. But when it came down to the nitty-gritty, the government was smart enough to aim squarely at Mr and Mrs aspirational lower middle class, rather than anyone who might have known who John Maynard Keynes was. The telephone company was being given back to the people, the message ran, not being reduced to chips in the world's biggest casino. And it worked. The applications flooded in by the thousands, taking just about everyone involved by surprise and making the government even more cash than they were expecting. Privatisation was not only economically viable, it was popular. Emboldened, Thatcher and her president of the Board of Trade, that seething shaved polecat Norman Tebbit, set about drawing up strategies to bring other public services into the private sector as well as selling off any shares the government might have still owned in any for-profit companies, such as BP, what was left of British Leyland, and the radio pharmaceutical company Amersham International. The next big non-profit to be dislodged from government auspices was to be British Gas. This would be the sale that came to symbolise the whole policy, thanks to the way it was sold to the public. Jack, Jack, sorry mate, you've got to go. These British gas shares, they couldn't be easier to do. Phone his number, and they send you information on how to apply. If you see it, tell him, won't you? Oi! Oh, I'm glad you're here. It'll interest you. British gas shares. They come out in November. If you see it, tell him. What's up? You know these British gas shares? They're really easy to do. Give him a ring. If you see Sid, tell him. It couldn't be easier to apply for a share of the shares. For more information and to reserve a prospectus, phone 0272 272 272 anytime. Lessons were learned from the telecom sell-off. Pitch at the ordinaries. Use lots of utopian imagery. And be sure to present the sell-off as a glorious opportunity for the struggling proletarian to get rich and leap up the class ladder. And it helps if you say as little as possible about the company itself and whatever it is it does. This all culminated in the now legendary premise, if you see Sid, tell him. We should all of these and more in a cosy small town setting and help make the British gas share offer into an even more gargantuan success than the telecom one. Privatisation was now not just popular, but downright fashionable. Stock portfolios began to replace, and more often complement, Rolexes and diamonds as signifiers of financial superiority. Everyone was Gordon Gecko. The yuppie had been born. Before Thatcher was gone, her government would also have sold off British Airways, British Steel, their remaining stake in BP, and at the end of the decade, the water and electricity utilities, by which time privatisation had been sufficiently normalised that the publicity no longer had to distance itself from the functions being sold off. Yes, that's right, they are selling your water to the highest bidder. What are you going to do about it? This is how the world works now. Get rich or die trying. With eerie symmetry, even when Labour finally came back to power, 
It was under the assumption that the barely regulated free market private enterprise all the way system that Thatcher had canonised was immutable, as fundamental as the air, just the way the world worked. There has been a revolution inside the Labour Party. We have rejected the worst of our past and rediscovered the best. And in rediscovering the best of our past, we have made ourselves fit to face the future and fit to govern. Thatcher once said that Tony Blair was her final victory, and this is what she meant. Just as Churchill and Eden had to accept Mr Attlee's legacy, so did Thatcher's successors, even in the opposing party, see no choice but to build upon what she'd done rather than roll it back. This is a modern party living in an age of change. It requires a modern constitution that says what we are in terms the public cannot misunderstand. This is the second post-war consensus. The Thatcher consensus. The one we're still living under now. Albeit only just as it finally starts to collapse and die. A third seems to be coming. It looks like it'll either be fascist or socialist. The former seem the most likely at the moment. Stay tuned. Everything was for sale in Thatcher's Britain, and generally speaking that worked to her advantage. There was one incident where it backfired on her, and led to the first major wobble since the dicey pre-Falklands years. In 1985, while preparing to dismantle and sell off British gas, a molehill was slowly becoming a mountain over Britain's last helicopter manufacturers, Westland, who happened to have a major government contract. Two members of Thatcher's cabinet were at loggerheads over its future. The Defence Secretary, Quaffield walking advert for British Airways business class Michael Heseltine, and Jewish Sontaran Leon Britton, freshly reshuffled President of the Board of Trade. Britton had started 1985 in a much more powerful position, that of Home Secretary. He wasn't particularly good at it. As previously detailed, he'd got the job after his predecessor, Willie Whitelaw, vetoed Thatcher's choice of Norman Tebbit. In truth, Britain probably wasn't even second choice, but here he was anyway in a great office of state. Ultimately, Britain just wasn't a strong man, and the job of Home Secretary requires a tough bastard. Britain, by all accounts, was barely a bastard at all. Many of his cabinet colleagues remembered him as a kindly soul. And while a lot of that must be the relativistic effects of being in Thatcher's cabinet and not being proactively despicable, you can sort of understand where they might have been coming from. He was a sad, ingratiating Peter Lorre type, with all the inherent authority of a startled frog, which is something he often resembled. Worse still, he didn't even have that startled frog's charm or charisma, and that was the real sticking point as far as Thatcher was concerned. Her government was about selling Britain as much as governing it, not just literally by privatisation, but symbolically as a brand. Geoffrey Howe was doing a brilliant job of promoting her vision abroad as Foreign Secretary, but his home counterpart simply wasn't getting the message across. So it was that in September 1985 she held a minor reshuffle, prompted by that man Tebbit stepping down as President of the Board of Trade to look after his wife, disabled in the Brighton bombing. Square-headed elder statesman-in-waiting Douglas Hurd took over as Home Secretary, and Leon was moved down a rung or two to take over Tebbit's old job, replacing him once again, in a more literal sense this time. Despite being a pretty unambiguous demotion, this may very well have come as a great relief to Britain, if not to Britain itself. But in reality, it's where his troubles really began. Michael Heseltine was the mirror opposite of Leon Britton. Handsome, relatively speaking, magnetic, and very much his own man. Too much so for the comfort of various Tory leaders, from Heath to Major, which ensured that he never occupied any of the great offices, even in shadow. In 1985, he was Defence Secretary, and already notorious for the infamous incident in 1976, 
at which he'd seemed prepared to beat the entire Labour front bench to death with the Speaker's ceremonial mace, after losing a vote on, prophetically, an aerospace bill. His legendary temper would be the engine for the scandal that ended Leon Britton's career, the Westmond Affair. <laughs> Westland Helicopters had been one of Britain's biggest aviation companies at one stage. A lot, if not most, of the helicopters used by the British Armed Forces, most recently in the Falklands, were Westland models. Unfortunately, by 1985, they hadn't been profitable for a very long time, and were very obviously heading straight for the receivers unless something happened sharpish. Rival chopperman Alan Bristow almost bought them out, but withdrew when the government could neither guarantee further orders nor wipe away a £40 million debt. This ultimately resulted in Sir John Cuckney, professional saviour of failing companies, being appointed Westland's chairman. He was an ally of Thatcher's, and this would become important. Cuckney's mere presence indicated how worried the government was getting about Westland's future, or lack thereof, and they spent months fishing around for some sort of bailout solution that wouldn't involve using public money, which in their eyes was tantamount to murder. Finally in November, by which time Leon Britton had taken up his new role at DTI, a bid came in from Sikorsky Aircraft, an American company. Cuckney and Western's management liked it. Heseltine didn't. As Defence Secretary, he may have had no trade-related duties, but he did decide which companies provided the various branches of the armed forces with their equipment, including the helicopters used by the Navy and Air Force. And he didn't much care for the idea of the British Army flying American choppers, nor for the prospect of Europe being completely frozen out of the aviation industry. To that end, he rang up the National Armaments Directors of the four major European powers, France, Italy, West Germany, and of course Britain ourselves, and convinced them to sign an agreement saying they'd only buy helicopters made in Europe, effectively blackmailing Westland into turning the Sikorsky deal down. Thatcher and Britain both agreed that this was unacceptable. Not because it was a douche move so much as because Thatcherite principles dictate that government interference in corporate affairs is a monstrous evil, comparable with anything Hitler ever did. The Prime Minister convened two meetings that together involved almost the entire top level of the Cabinet to try and get the thing sorted out. Britain wanted the NADs to drop the No Yankee Choppers Agreement. A mini-compromise was mini-reached. Thatcher gave them a fortnight to find a Europe-based bid to replace Sikorsky's. If they managed that and Western still turned it down, then Sikorsky won and the NADs could just about sod off with their demands. Ultimately, that's what happened. Heseltine succeeded in putting together a bid from a European consortium under which Westland and British Aerospace would be integrated with Augusta of Italy and a bunch of French companies, and Westland did indeed turn it down. Heseltine demanded another cabinet meeting. Thatcher brushed him off, saying Westland had made its choice. But the European consortium weren't done yet. They submitted a fresh bid shortly before Christmas. Leon Britton protested that it was too late, but legally speaking, Westland was still obliged to consider it. Britain and Heseltine started openly attacking each other, verbally, we hasten to add, in the corridors of Parliament, and it wasn't long before the country as a whole were aware of the whole situation. It was to be a bitter Christmas slash Hanukkah, and it wasn't over yet. As 1986 dawned, Heseltine picked up his efforts to get Westland to pick the European option. When Cuckney expressed his concern about a Sikorsky-backed Westland's potential sales to European governments, Britain and Thatcher soothingly promised they continue to support them. Heseltine spotted an opportunity, but Thatcher told him he wasn't allowed to contradict her in front of Cuckney. Fortunately for him, he got his chance anyway when Lloyds Bank wrote to him on the subject. Heseltine decided to put his reply in the form of an open letter to the Times, in which he said that contrary to Britain and Thatcher's reassurances, Western would almost certainly lose a significant amount of European business if they went for the Sikorsky option. Thatcher, of course, was not impressed, except possibly by Heseltine's balls. Warned not to contradict the Prime Minister in front of Sir John Cutney, he doubled down and contradicted her in front of the entire nation. 
Thatcher put the Solicitor General, Patrick Mayhew, on the case, and he composed a reply to Heseltine in which he criticised several material inaccuracies he'd apparently made. Unlike Heseltine's letter to Lloyds, this one was supposed to be private, like letters normally are. So when its content showed up on the Press Association wire, the engine oil really hit the propeller. It had been leaked to the PA by Colette Bow, a future Ofcom chief, but then Chief Information Officer for the Department of Trade and Industry, Britain's department. But she was evidently only following orders. The only question was whose. On the 9th of January, Thatcher convened yet another cabinet meeting in Downing Street on the subject of Westland, at which both Britain and Heseltine put forward their cases once and for all. Thatcher concluded that since negotiations were still ongoing, any further parliamentary answers on the subject should be cleared through the Cabinet Office first. Britain and Heseltine concurred. Then Transport Secretary Nicholas Ridley, played by Michael Foot Skeleton, piped up with a crucial detail. Should this not apply to statements already made? In other words, can we use this rule to shut Heseltine up completely? What a good idea, Thatcher thought. Heseltine was therefore instantly banned from reaffirming anything in the original letter. Inevitably, he was furious. Thatcher, in so many words, told him to eat it, citing cabinet collective responsibility, the principle that the entire cabinet has to support the absolute bottom line, whether the individual members like it or not. At this point, Heseltine took his papers, stood up, and said, I cannot be a member of this cabinet anymore. Successfully resisting the urge to turn the table over and start slapping people in the face, he immediately walked out of the room and out of the cabinet. Two hours later, he was in Parliament, delivering a furious 22-minute speech about how Thatcher was stubborn, ignorant and self-important. Which everyone already knew, but no one had been brave enough to actually point out before. Heseltine's departure did sort out the immediate problem of the Cabinet being in each other's throats. But there was still that leak to figure out. Who ordered Bo to let the Press Association read Mayhew's letter to Heseltine? Could it possibly have been Leon Britton, the frustrated little man who just suffered a demotion from a position he had no business inhabiting in the first place? Of course it was, as the inquiry discovered just a few days later. A further question did arise. Was he in turn acting under orders from Thatcher? But no one was dumb enough to pursue it. And besides, Thatcher, when she learned about the leak, was as shocked as anyone, at least according to Havers. Unless the PM is the most marvellous actress I've ever seen in my life. It remains possible that she was indeed exactly that good an actress. But everyone, perhaps wisely, decided to quit while they were ahead. Except for Britain, who quit while he was at his absolute lowest ebb, after barely four months in the job. We Conservatives believe in popular capitalism, believe in a property-owning democracy, and it works. And so Thatcher went on, having ridden out the first major wobble of her premiership. It wasn't that Heseltine had been the first person to stand up to her since she became PM. There were the likes of Francis Pym and Jim Pryor and Ted Heath, of course. But they were quickly consigned to the dustbin by Thatcher herself, symbolically crushed in her iron fist. Heseltine escaped that fate by actively resigning and doing it in spectacular fashion. He couldn't defeat Thatcher, although he came close. But he didn't surrender. And the veneer of invincibility got its first tiny smudge. Who says we've run out of steam? We're in our prime. Draftsman, build me a path from cradle to grave, and I'll give my consent to any government that does not deny a man a living wage. Go find the young men, never to fight again. Bring up the banners from the days gone by. Sweet moderation.
heart of this nation Desert us not, we are between the wars Thank you.